My name's Gareth Davis. I'm principal flute with the London Symphony Orchestra, and I'm delighted today to have not one, but two conductors and musicians. Um, I don't need to introduce Sir Colin Davis, president of the London Symphony Orchestra, and one of our newest recruits in terms of conducting, Nikolai Schneider. Now, uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, now, we're here today to talk about conducting, something which I only know from being at the end of both of your sticks. <laughs> but first of all, let's start with you, Nikolai, because um, you did a, your first concert in London with the LSO last night as conductor. Of course, we know you very well as a fantastic violin soloist. But this is a, a relatively new departure for you. Well, it wasn't really, a, it's not as new as it seems. You know, it's new in a lot of places because it takes a long time until you been everywhere, so. But I, I have wanted to do this for, for a long time. I wanted to do it before I knew I wanted to do it. Um, <laughs> it's true. It's true. I started, uh, it, it really came from, from the music itself. It came from, from studying. I, I, I remember a few specific uh, moments. I, I started studying things outside of the immediate literature that I was playing. I remember particularly when I was recording the Beethoven Violin Concerto, I was thinking, well, how do I get to know this piece better? You know, I played it many times, I knew the score, and, and yet something was missing, so I bought a piano, and I bought a, all the, the, the piano sonatas of Beethoven. I thought, well, that's a good place to start. And then I bought all the, the, the scores for all the symphonies, and I started studying it, and, and it was in this process of widening my own horizon that, that finally this, this impulse came that, that, my God, I have to, I have to, not f for anybody else, but for me, I have to spend my life with this music, with this great mm. literature. Now, Sir Colin, I know you used to play the clarinet. It's a very long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I won't hold that against you. But, uh, <laughs> um, what made you decide to make the leap from the dark side to the dark side, I should say. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> so it, wh when you played the clarinet, was it, was it a, a, a sudden decision or...? or no, so I remember I, um, I was 13, I think, and it was in the school holidays. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, my brother had recently acquired a recording of Beethoven's Eighth Symphony. And uh, once I'd heard that, I really had to be a musician. I just couldn't help it. <laughs> and so the, um, I listened to as much music as I could, and I bought scores. And, you know, it was a, but it was the most irrational thing to have done, decide to be a conductor. Absolutely ridiculous. I knew nothing about anything. I still don't know much about anything. But I can assure you, at the age of 13, I didn't know anything. But this, uh, th this thing called music rescued me from uh, the uh, bigger disasters of adolescence. <laughs> and it may explain why I've never entirely grown up. <laughs> <laughs> Long may it continue. <laughs> um, so how can I put this? Musicians aren't always the most friendly bunch of people and certainly when you stand in front of an orchestra for the first time it it must be a terrifying moment I remember speaking to um, Valery Gergiev um, a while ago and somebody asked him what it was like the first time he conducted an orchestra and he said he was so nervous that on the upbeat he his baton flew into the audience which is probably why he doesn't use one now um, <laughs> but I think it's a it's particularly difficult I would imagine, having been in an orchestra, and people know you as a player, as a soloist, or, or somebody in an orchestra, to then stand up in front of people you know, which must happen to you both. How do Awful. You, <laughs> in a word. How do yes. you find that, Nikolai? The thing that helps me is to try and remove the I from, from this. You know, it's, it's, it's to try and be part of something, so it's not me against somebody. I think this is a... a big trap to avoid, you know, not to see the orchestra as somebody you work against, but somebody, or somebody you have to overcome, but somebody you have to work with. Mm. And that certainly helps me, but I know the, the I, I remember the first time I conducted, I was so tired after the first rehearsal, 
Versa was over maybe at 12 or 1, whenever they're over. And I remember I was being so tired, I went to take a nap. I didn't wake up until the next morning. <laughs> that's, how, that's how much it took out of me the first time. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just don't tell the orchestra that. You won't no, get any no, sympathy. No, no. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's very interesting because um, you both say very similar things. Now, I don't know whether it's because you speak a lot, but one thing that you said, Sir Colin, many times, and I would agree with, is that you, you like to let the orchestra play. I mean, you quite often say, I don't do anything, which is, of course, totally not true. Um, but you do, you do allow us to play, which is one thing, as you just said, Nikolai, that, that actually you have to work with the orchestra. I mean, I don't know whether you think of the orchestra as another instrument or a combination of instruments. But actually, one thing that you do uh, in the short time that we've been working together um, with you as conductor is that you do give us the space to play. You let us play. Um, is that something that you, Sir Colin, have, have developed over time? Do, have, you, have you always allowed the orchestra to do that, or have you been more...? No, I, 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 it's not something I'm anxious to recall. <laughs> <laughs> what a hot-tempered creature I was. But uh, this business of allowing people space to play is that I'm always telling conductors, you know, the first thing you have to do as a conductor is to enjoy what other people are doing because you're not doing anything. And so if you don't enjoy what they're doing, you know, it's a sin against the Holy Ghost, really, isn't it? Especially in the <coughs> wonderful orchestra. <coughs> Excuse me, like yours, where everybody can play and amazingly well. <coughs> it's astounding. And <coughs> I don't think of the orchestra as an instrument. They're, they're a bunch of human beings. And the astonishing thing is that uh, they may be 90 or just 35 or whatever. They, they're such disparate personalities. Heavens, you wouldn't believe how dif different and difficult they are. <laughs> <laughs> but they come along, they hang their jackets on the hook, and they agree to cooperate. And it's absolutely amazing. And when somebody goes, <laughs> and it blows up, and it's magic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> First note of the third movement. It was great, wasn't it? Oh, yes, in, the, in Brahms 4 last yeah. night. It was, a, it was a rocket. <laughs> well, do you know what he told us to do? What? He said it's a sound like champagne corks popping. Always no, a That's very difficult when you've got 90 people. <laughs> <coughs> the relationship between you two, I know you've talked a lot about conducting. How, what, what kind of things has Colin been able to, to give you, to show you? <laughs> You can just don't listen for a minute, Colin. <laughs> but I think the, the, the truly remarkable thing about, about uh, Sir Colin is that he's able to teach without you noticing. And I don't even know if you notice it either. <laughs> but, it's, but it's actually in, it sounds funny, but it's, but it's actually also true that it's in, in these, in these uh, conversations that we have, quite intimate conversations about, about life and about music, of course, first of all, that I've learned you know, if you know how to listen, I suppose, then, then there's so much to be learned from a conversation with, with somebody who is as, as um, genuinely generous, I would say, who, who gives of himself. We know a lot of people who, who have this shield, this facade to, to protect the, um, the person. And there is no such thing with Sir Colin. And I, I think that's why I was able to, to be like a sponge and just try and absorb everything that in, in our conversations that we, that we spoke about and tried to make it my own. Mm. When, when you're a, an instrumentalist, of course, you can stand and practice your scales and you can practice your pieces and exercises. Practicing as a conductor is a little more tricky, I would imagine. Uh, I, I mean, I presume you don't stand in front of a mirror with a baton like this sort of pop star with a mirror, <laughs> uh, a hairbrush. But um, how do you practice? Is it just simply a case of standing in front of an orchestra and you've just got to do it? at the time, do you practice with a, a, a piano, or how, how does it work? Well, the difficult part of, of conducting, because it is very difficult, the difficult part is that you go like that, and a response comes, or, or doesn't come, <laughs> from, the, 
from the orchestra. And that's where you have to learn. And that's why no mirror can help you. Or, of course, you can do something at home so that the hands get, the muscles get used to moving. But until you have a true response from a group of people, it doesn't mean anything. That's what's so difficult about, about conducting, I think. Yeah. I know that, that, that you, Colin, uh, quite regularly tell us off for playing too far behind the beat. Yes. It's a very bad habit. But I know that's one of those things that as different orchestras have different tuning, different orchestras have a different way of responding to the beat, and, and different beats gain a different response as well. Do you find that something, Colin, that, that changes around the world? Yes, but if the music is going to be on the breath, mm. which is where we want it, and we, we've proved this over and over again. If we all breathe together, it's always together. Yeah. And nobody can do anything about it. But if you breathe and don't do anything, you will have to damage yourself. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the worst thing, you know. I'll, I'll tell you both now, conductors, when you go, oh, and just one more thing. <laughs> 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 and you can hear the entire wind section explode. <laughs> But it's it, it, interesting, because you are one of the few conductors that talks about breathing, um, probably partly uh, as coming from a wind-playing background. Well, hopefully. I would think so. But it, it's interesting, but you, you also do the same thing, even though you're not a wind player, because it does get everything together. But even string players... Breathe. Even? Even string even players. Even string players. <laughs> <laughs> pianists, not always. What about pianists? <laughs> <laughs> they don't breathe. No. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite strange, but that's something which you you've mentioned time and time again. But do you do you find that, for instance, when when you're working in Germany, is that is that something? Do they play further behind the beat? Well, they they, they can mess about. Oh no! Uh, we did the Eighth Symphony of Beethoven, and we got to the concert. Do you know what they did? Beat on a deeper form. They silent for the whole of that beat. They started there, so it was really in four four. <laughs> and I claimed that I bitterly complained about that. They didn't do it again, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> and who says they don't have a sense of humour? Well, they exactly do. <laughs> They're wicked. No, I, think the, I think the reason that, that orchestras enjoy playing with other conductors is because they feel important. Everybody feels like they, they are necessary for the final product. Now, the great thing about the LSO is that when there is a conductor, everybody feels responsible for the final result and, and give accordingly. All art or, or poetry or great musicianship aside, from a purely practical point of view, you need a conductor. For most repertoire written after 18, help me, 70, 80, something like that. Um, and on a less practical level, ideally the, the, the role of the conductor is I wouldn't say to animate, because a great orchestra, such as the LSO, is animated by itself. They, they, they have enough enthusiasm on their own. But uh, somebody who unifies the musical ideas, I suppose. Somebody who, who becomes the glue when there's, when there's a lot of great musical personalities in an orchestra. I think you, you probably have something better. No, no, I think it's a, what, what we have to do is come up with a what will become the generally, for the concert, I mean, generally accepted idea of the piece that we can all subscribe to and have the satisfaction of feeling free to play within a certain framework. Isn't that what you expect of us? Absolutely. Um, so, Colin, George on Twitter, who I don't know, um, <laughs> he wants to know if you still knit. Well, I haven't been doing any knitting for... For several weeks, <laughs> is the truth, because I, I did work very hard for 20 years, knitting all kinds of things for my family to wear, and uh, my daughters knit like fiends now, and I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I liked, I enjoyed it very much, because it's a big discipline. Mm. You know, you can't blame anybody else for your mistakes, and if, when you make a bit mistake, you could just got to undo it. And that infuriates certain people who have tried to knit. You know, they throw it out of the window because they make so many mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> A philosophical knitter. Yeah. Marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please um, join me in thanking Sir Colin and Nikolai. It's been a 
treat for me to have two of my favourite musicians, and I mean that most sincerely, um, to be able to sit and speak to them. Um, it's been very interesting. Thank you very much, Jim.